Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us, Episode 27, Apollo Computers and Software. Last time, we talked about the boosters and engines that provided the raw physical power required to send Apollo on its way to the moon. If the boosters represent the muscle of Apollo, then today we'll be talking about its brain, the computers and software that ran the whole show. As usual, it pains me to say that I will only be able to skim the surface of a topic that is as deep as it is fascinating, but by the end of this episode, you will hopefully have a newfound appreciation for a strange little bronze box from the 1960s. A quick disclaimer. As I've mentioned before, though I am a spaceflight history podcaster by night, I spend my days as a software engineer, so it's very possible that I'm going to accidentally gloss over some core concept that I've taken for granted. If anything is unclear, I highly encourage you to shoot me an email at jp at thespaceabove.us, and I'd be happy to clarify. And I guess if everything makes sense the first time, just shoot me an email to say hi. As with most aspects of the Apollo program, I find that it can sometimes be difficult to put things in the proper perspective. At the time that NASA set its sights on the moon, computers were a little different than they were today. Let's do a comparison. The computer that I use to record this podcast, as well as goof off in virtual reality and spend too much time playing Overwatch, has 16 gigabytes of memory, a 4-core, 3.3 gigahertz central processing unit, and a graphics processing unit that is so far removed from the computers of the 1960s that it may as well be alien technology. With modern CPUs, this can be sort of tough to nail down, but by my math, it can complete something like 53 billion instructions per second. All told, it cost me about 1500 bucks. In the other corner, we have the IBM 7030. It was introduced in 1961, could perform 1.2 million instructions per second, and its form factor could best be described as furniture. Oh, and it could be yours for the low, low price of $7.8 million, which shakes out to around $63 million when you account for inflation. So arbitrarily choosing instructions per second as our metric, my trusty PC is about 44,000 times faster and about 42,000 times cheaper. Multiply them together, and that's about 1.8 billion times better. Like I said, things were a little bit different. So with that comparison in your head, imagine that you are now tasked with making a computer for the Apollo program. It needs to calculate guidance and navigation equations quickly and reliably. It needs to have a human interface so that the crew can interact with it. It needs to resist bit-flipping radiation from space, and it needs to be as small and light as possible. Oh, and uh, if you screw up, three brave astronauts are going to be stranded in space forever. No pressure. Because it's space, get it? But actually, before we dive into the main computer for the Apollo spacecraft, we're going to take a quick diversion. Remember my little shout-out at the end of the last episode? That's right, I mentioned something about the instrumentation unit. This large ring-shaped structure sat on top of the S-4B stage and contained control equipment for the Saturn 1B and Saturn V rockets. It was about 22 feet wide, 3 feet high, and weighed in at about the same as an SUV. Carefully arranged around its interior was the primary flight computer, emergency detection systems, gear to collect and transmit real-time telemetry, and support equipment to keep everything cool and functioning. Perhaps the most important part of the instrumentation unit was the Launch Vehicle Digital Computer, or LVDC. While the Apollo Guidance Computer served as the brains of the spacecraft, the LVDC served as the brains of the booster. During ascent, things moved very quickly, and a lot of power was just barely being controlled. To successfully operate in such an environment, the LVDC was designed to handle the few minutes of launch in as robust and reliable a way as possible. Redundancy was built into all aspects of its design. It actually contained three copies of the same logic circuitry, which would all vote on the best response to the dynamics of that moment. This meant that whole swaths of the computer process could fail, but the Saturn would stay right on track. The LVDC ran the show during the ride to orbit, but then the mission came under the control of the Apollo Guidance Computer. And actually, the AGC was keeping a watchful eye on the LVDC the whole time, and could take over in case of a failure. Thankfully, that never came up. But one other note on that topic, there was a dial in the Apollo cockpit 
that would allow the commander to take direct control of the Saturn engines via his hand controller. How the 11 astronauts, all former test pilots, who sat in the commander seat of the Saturn V, resisted the temptation to control 7.5 million pounds of thrust with the flick of his hand, I will never know. The Apollo Guidance Computer was one of the first parts of the Apollo program to be put under contract, and one of the later parts to be ready. An engineering marvel for its time, it was responsible for, you guessed it, guiding the spacecraft to the moon, to the lunar surface, and back home again. It weighed 70 pounds, about as much as 23 MacBook Pros, but practically sipped electricity, using only 55 watts. The main computer looked like a big bronze box about half the size of a microwave. The interface for the crew was made up of several numeric displays and a small keyboard, imaginatively called the Display and Keyboard, DISCI for short. Using the DISCI, the crew could call up programs for specific tasks, view the status of various computer parameters, or even patch the software on the fly. We're going to be getting into a lot of the functions of the AGC in the episodes to come, but I wanted to take some time to get into the real nitty-gritty of how the thing was made and operated, the almost literal nuts and bolts. So today we're going to be taking a close look at its memory system. Without memory, a computer can't do much. It not only uses memory to allow it to keep track of values and parameters pertaining to the current task, but also to store long series of instructions on how to perform that task in the first place. Pretty much all computer memory is stored as binary digits. I say pretty much because I know that if I don't, someone will dig up some crazy grad school thesis computer system that runs on peanut butter or something, so I'm playing it safe here. Realistically, though, all computers work like this. Binary digits, or bits, are just a way of representing a 1 or a 0. A light switch could store a bit, or a coin flipped to one side or the other. 1 or 0, on or off. No matter what technology you're using to store that memory, be it punch cards, transistors, magnetic sectors, or whatever, it all comes down to a bunch of tiny switches. Without getting all the way down into the fundamentals of computing, computers use memory to store data that tell them how to run, typically in groups of bits that are sometimes called words. You may be familiar with a byte, which is just another name for a word, or group, of 8 bits. The ability to store and access words and memory is fundamental for any computer system. The Apollo Guidance Computer had two types of memory, random access memory and read-only memory. Random access memory, or RAM, is used for values that change as the computer is running, such as where it is in the program, what time it is, and what number was just input via the disky, stuff like that. Read-only memory, or ROM, is used for information that does not need to change during the course of the mission. Typical values stored in read-only memory would be physical constants such as the positions of prominent stars and the diameter of the moon, as well as machine instructions on how to do, well, anything they want the spacecraft to do. You may actually be more familiar with read-only memory than you might think, especially if you've ever used a video game system that accepts game cartridges. When you buy that nice gray plastic rectangle depicting an Italian plumber on the cover, what you're really buying is a series of machine instructions that tells your game console how to display the game and how to react to your inputs. The AGC ROM could store 36,864 words of memory, with each word storing 15 bits of data, along with a 16th bit that was only used for memory integrity tests. So with 36,864 words of memory at 16 bits each, that's just shy of 600,000 bits total, and only around 552,000 of them were usable. For everything. Navigating to the moon, placing the vehicle in orbit around the moon, descending to the surface, returning home, everything. Of course, that's slightly misleading, since both the command module and the lunar module had their own computer, and each was programmed differently for their own specialized tasks, but you get the idea. For comparison, a typical game on the original Nintendo Entertainment System clocked in at around 256 kilobytes, or 262,144 bytes. And since a byte is 8 bits, that's just over 2 million bits, or almost 4 times as much as the entire Apollo Guidance computer. 
but the comparatively small amount of memory isn't the only thing that makes the AGC ROM so impressive. As a software guy, I'm fascinated by the intricate programming required to do such complex tasks with such limited resources. But what I really can't stop thinking about is how the ROM was stored. The AGC used a now long obsolete technology called Core Rope Memory. Core Rope Memory was cool because it was super robust, both to typical environmental conditions, as well as the occasional cosmic ray encountered beyond Earth's protective atmosphere. It was composed of thousands of tiny cores, along with a ridiculous number of thin conductive wires. Each core was a small ring made out of ferrous material, like iron, but not magnetic on its own. It could have dozens of wires passing through them, or not passing through them. Why a core might or might not have a wire passing through it is a tricky question that calls for a tricky analogy. Imagine that you have four bells that each produce a different note when struck. Now imagine that each bell has a small loop on the side that you could pass a string through. With me so far? Four bells, each with their own note, and each with a small loop on the side. Let's label them A, B, C, and D. Now take a string and pass it through the loop of all four bells. What would happen if you pulled on the string? You would hear the notes for bells A, B, C, and D. Let's take a second string and only pass it through the loops for A and C, bypassing B and D entirely. What would happen if you pulled that string? You would hear the notes for A and C. With our little four bell system, we can encode 16 different patterns. Starting with a string that passed through no bells, then just A, then just B, just C, just D, then A, B, A, C, A, D, and so on. What we have constructed is a method to transmit 4-bit words of data. If the bell rings when you pull the string, we'll call that a 1. If it doesn't, we'll call it a 0. If you number each of your strings and pull them in order, you now have a great way to store data encoded in 4-bit words by choosing which bells the strings should physically pass through. This is more or less how core rope memory works. But instead of bells, we have ferrous cores. Instead of strings, we have conductive wire. Instead of notes, we have electronic sensors. And instead of four bells, we have 16 cores. Also, instead of tugging on a string, we instead send an electric pulse down the wire. When the electricity passes through the wire, it induces a magnetic field around it. If the wire happens to pass through a core, the magnetic field in turn creates an electric current in the core which can be read by a sensor wire. When the sensor wire has a current, call it a 1. When it doesn't, call it a 0. So by sending an electric pulse down one of these wires and paying attention to the output of the sensor wires, we can read a 16-bit word. With some additional clever tricks, the computer can choose which wire to send the pulse down and thus which location to read in memory. In order to create the long strands of core rope required to encode instructions on how to fly to the moon, NASA turned to some unsung heroes of the space race. Creating core rope memory takes a lot of attention to detail, a dexterous hand, and the ability to carefully weave a thin metal cable in and out of a grid of thousands of cores. So who better to turn to than skilled textile workers? The chosen women took the lives of the Apollo astronauts in their hands, and by precisely encoding the program data, safely sent them to the moon and back. Incidentally, a meme was nearly born before its time, since some of the engineers took to calling this memory little old lady memory after the workers who wove the core ropes. They went with LOL memory for short. Core rope memory is great for storing a bunch of data that never changes, but the AGC also needed a memory type with the ability to read and write. To solve this, cores were again used, but this time in a different configuration that allowed the cores themselves to maintain a slight magnetic charge. By pointing the magnetic field in one way or the other, it was possible to represent a 1 or a 0. And as we know by now, that's all you need. Since each core in core rope memory could accommodate multiple wires, you could get away with more usable memory per core. With random access memory, it was a straight 1-bit per core relationship. Because of this, the AGC only had 2,048 words of random access memory, 
as compared to the 36,864 words of read-only memory. But with careful rationing, and by keeping as much data as possible in the read-only memory, this was just fine. The Apollo Guidance Computer is one of those facets of the space program that can easily slip by most spaceflight fans unnoticed, despite its importance to the success of the moon landing. I think that part of it stems from the fact that computers these days are easy to take for granted. They're literally in everything and everywhere. Just off the top of my head, I carry five or six around with me every day, including my camera, flash drive, phone, and so on. I think especially for people who have grown up around computers, it's hard to be all that impressed by them. Like, did you know that in the 60s they made a computer that could do math? Yeah, Dad, it's called a calculator. Ironically, I think another reason for its lack of attention comes from the other direction. While computers are ubiquitous, they also remain inscrutable to many users. For a lot of people, it's hard enough to grasp the interface of their favorite social media website, let alone the bare metal pushing bits around that makes the whole thing possible. And I don't even mean that as a dig, computers are insanely complex at every layer of abstraction, and there are a lot of layers of abstraction. The Apollo Guidance Computer was ahead of its time, but not by all that much. Core rope memory, strange interfaces, microwave-like form factors, these all remove the AGC from our day-to-day -day experience with computers and make it a sort of alien relic. My hope with this episode is that while I only touched on a few aspects of this incredible device, it will serve to highlight its role throughout the upcoming episodes. The AGC rarely gets to take center stage, so I wanted to be sure you appreciated the impressive job it was quietly taken care of in the background. Next time, we'll learn about one half of the dynamic duo of spacecraft that made the moon landing possible. Well, really two-thirds. The poor service module always gets overlooked. Well, no longer. On the next episode of The Space Above Us, we'll learn about the command module and service module. Two incredibly complex spacecraft in their own right, they join forces to create the command center for each Apollo mission. And since it's been a while since I've done this, I just wanted to say thanks so much to those of you who have taken the time to leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, Facebook, or wherever the cool kids hang out on the internet these days. These reviews mean a lot to me personally, and they also help me reach a wider audience and get even more people interested in human spaceflight history. So really, thanks. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass.